Hello, printmakers. Welcome to Post Studio Printmaking with artist, researcher, teacher. This is the SGAI, SGCI Make Ready Conference 2021. Uh, and thank you for joining us for this panel. Um, I am Samuel H. Peck, artist, researcher, researcher teacher. Uh, I have an MFA uh, gained in 2010 from UNC Greensboro in printmaking. Um, currently a PhD student in arts education, curriculum and instruction at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and here with me. Hi everyone, my name is Brett J. Taylor and I'm an artist and educator. I got my BFA in drawing at the University of Florida and I'm currently working on my MFA at Ohio State University, exploring the intersection between ability and queerness and how it relates to the masculine form um, and masculinity. And this is a picture from Chautauqua 2020 of Sam and I, um, where this kind of all started in Minneapolis at our print residency. Uh, so to talk a little bit about the formation of this panel and the call that get put out, um, Brett and I were thinking about Daniel Buren's 1971 essay, The Function of the Studio, where he posits the analysis, of the analysis of the art system must inevitably be carried on in terms of the studio as its unique space and the museum are unique spaces of exposition. Both must be investigated as customs, ossifying customs of art. What is the function of the studio, he famously posits. Uh, the health concerns resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic Printmaking practices for the artist, researcher, teacher necessitated transitions from the studio's conventional notions into arenas and formats. So Brett and he, I here were thinking about, you know, there's a switch and a change that's happened uh, as we've been working in the studio and how how is this kind of changed for printmakers and printmaking in general. Um, so this panel will explore the diverse conceptualizations of post-studio printmaking as the COVID-19 shift has ushered forth opportunities for new ad adaptations, whether that be into traditional print practices, exhibition formats, community organization, the sharing of resources, or teaching methods. The artists and printmakers on this panel explore conceptual spaces opened up by these new problems to transform how we see and shape our worlds. Uh, and on the left, you can see an image from uh, some of Buren's work. Um, this was out of the John Weber Gallery in New York City. Um, and we uh, uh, pulled this from a blog, uh, Zoe Louise Storer's blog. So to kind of condense that a little bit, our central question was what innovations have resulted due to post-studio printmaking in our COVID-19 situation? So just a little sneak peek on the right, this was um, our relief inking and printing techniques that we produced over the summer for the Chautauqua Institution and Chautauqua Visual Arts um, that normally on the left would be situated in person and then we had to transition it to be online and starting to think about how an open network of sharing. So we not only shared these with the students and Chautauquans here, but also openly on our YouTube channel and also thought about, encouraged others to share these in a rhizomic fashion so that the videos would continue out into the world and different communities and thinking about how this possibly could return printmaking back to its democratized form and this idea of the open kind of community. And if it was possible to establish a printmaking community in a virtual setting. Um, just to say a little more, we're, we're hoping to go back to Chautauqua, that end of the rainbow space, uh, so to speak. And you can see that on the left-hand side uh, in these images. Uh, so we're excited and hopeful to go back to that, um, you know, knock on all things wood. Um, Brett, could you forward the next to the next slide? Uh, and so we just wanted to show some of the artists that we worked with when we were at Chautauqua. Uh, these are three examples. Prince Kang, Alex DeCanto, and Michael Fernandez, as well as three different ways of working. Um, so you can see Michael Fernandez's work in uh, etching plexiglass and then the print that resulted, uh, a lino cut piece. Uh, so in the middle, you can see Alex DeCanto's work and some of the lino cut works that she made. And then on the left, uh, the mono prints that Princeton Can made, uh, Kang made along with some of his, his digital pieces. So he's mixing and matching those together to make new comp compositions. 
Um, these were really exciting for us. We had a very open curriculum, very different. Uh, every week we went over a new process for a seven week residency, but we also thought about making a less pre pressured curriculum. So students were allowed to follow along, but they didn't have to produce anything. They could just be a part of the studio practice. Also thinking about ways we could care for students during the pandemic as they move through it and remove those pressures of producing, making, and having to follow along with that, that stringent schedule. Um, so if they decided to take in the content and then make work later, that was on them. Uh, we were available for the seven weeks, uh, but also to make themselves available to participate in these things and to be in conversation with both, both, both of us uh, as studio practitioners. What is happening in your practice? What are you thinking about right now? If it isn't print, what is happening? Uh, just so we could continue conversations, help them along their practice, help them move forward in whatever ways felt fruitful for them, uh, but also to rethink the ways that we work as educators so that it wasn't as structured and not about a critical space, but more of a building space for them as students. So with that in mind, after hosting our own kind of, or experimenting with our own post-studio printmaking, we wanted to put out an open call for SG, our SGCI panel, considering um, what other people might have done in different professions, in different areas of the printmaking community. Um, so that led us to our artist researcher teacher panel for post-studio printmaking, including your panelists. Uh, Henry Gepfer, adjunct professor at Edinburgh University, operator at, at Resolve Studio, who we'll get to briefly uh, in a moment. Uh, Matthew Ledzelter, Associate Professor, Chair of the MFA and Print Media Program, Pacific Northwest College of Art. Uh, Susanna Trejo-Williams, Assistant Professor at Campbellsville Univ University, excuse me. Christopher Thomas, Academic Professional, Director of Foundations, Printmaking and Drawing at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Tatiana Potts, Visiting Professor at Hartford University. Um, and our absent member because of family emergency, Catherine Coca Polite, Assistant Curator and Publication Specialist, Cranert Art Museum. Uh, and we're sorry that she's not with us today. Um, uh, and shortly, I, I want to introduce you to Henry Gepfer. Uh, he is an artist proudly living and working in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, they earned a BSc in art education from Millersville University and MFA in printmaking from Edinburgh University, both Pennsylvania. Gepfer teaches Gettys at Gettysburg College, excuse me, and Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, Lancaster, and works as a press operator for Resolve Studio in Lancaster as well. Gepfer has served on the board of the Mid-America Print Council and as a curator with Little Berlin, Philadelphia. Their work has been shown in solo and group exhibitions at the Sesuquina, and you're going to have to correct me on this, Henry, I apologize, Sesuquina, excuse me, Sesuquina Museum of Art in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Hesian Gallery, Medville, Pennsylvania, and the Carnegie Center for Art and History in New Albany, Indiana. They've completed artist residencies both nationally and internationally with Zygo Press, Cleveland, Ohio, the Waziak Project, New York, uh, as well as Sparks Best, Sparkbox Studio, Picton, Ontario, Canada, and has participated in the Fabric Workshop and Museum Apprentice Training Program, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Geffer has been a finalist in the Print Center's 87th and 95th annual international competitions as well. And with, without further ado, here is Henry. Awesome. Uh, Susquehanna and Rosaic. Hi, my name is Henry Gepfer. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my presentation is called Teaching into the Void or How I Learned That Stupid is Fine. Um, during the initial onset of COVID-19, uh, with the gracious help of my partner, Stephanie, um, I made two thematic demo videos for my class at Gettysburg College. Um, the first video is a, it's themed after a public access campy cooking show. It's called Cooking with Prince. Um, I themed my videos based on some kind of thematic or otherwise link between the processes I was demonstrating. So Cooking with Prince centers on um, processes that utilize something from your kitchen. So you can see a screenshot from potato printing. Um, we also did some water-based uh, marker transfers utilizing styrofoam plates. 
And finally, uh, kitchen lithography, which is what uh, most people ended up really being enamored with, uh, despite its difficulty. The second video is called um, Print is Great, and I am not, it's roughly translated from French. It's named after my favorite Audrey Tauto movie. Um, but it's a French melodrama that is silent meets mid-century uh, American how-to video. Uh, and it was themed as such because two of the processes have a French name. So I started with frottage, um, line trace monoprinting, and finished up with a spray paint variant on Pouchois that I learned from Nick Satinover. Um, this is a quick video that gives you an idea of what to anticipate from these. Are you stuck inside? Are you sad? Do you wish you could be in the studio printing on a 30 by 50 Charles brand press with an automated drive and brand new felts? Well, you still can't do that, but I have some other exciting options for you to print at home, my friend. We, oui. for the viewing audience at home, that means yes. Okay, um, so in case it wasn't already clear what I mean when I say stupid. Um, stupid is a relatively subjective term. Um, I recognize that it's also pretty polarizing. So if you would prefer, we could use frivolous or silly, but I really love the self-effacing nature of the term stupid. Uh, in large part, this is because my personal practice really seeped into these videos. And my goal for my practice is to talk about smart things in a dumb way or vice versa. I often feel like this puts me at odds with the print community at large, which is full of really, really smart, very technically savvy people. Um, so when I approached making demos through camp and silliness, it was a multifaceted and strategic decision. Uh, so my top secret plan in three parts, part one, uh, soothe collective anxieties. Early on in the uh, COVID shutdown, I found this Facebook group, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. This is Printmaking Distance Teaching, which was created by Camilla Taylor in March of 2020. Super great uh, place to act as a sounding board and just to see what other people were up to. It's especially helpful in trying to reconfigure half a semester that had already been planned to be in person, especially for somebody like me that had never taught online before. Um, but I wanted this to be a collective thing, so I wanted to make videos that were kind of silly so that my students could watch these and learn something just like they would if they were in my classroom, but maybe throw in some goofiness so that it would take their mind off of, hopefully, some of the awful things that are happening in the world. Part two of my top secret plan is professional development. Um, what I mean by professional development isn't necessarily like speaking at conferences or doing other things, although this is pretty chill. I mean more along the lines of like learning how to teach online for the first time and becoming better at what we do because the COVID-19 shutdown called for us to really step up uh, as educators. Um, when you're in the classroom on your best and worst day, you're still an authority figure and because you're the adult in the room. You have this like special place, but when you're suddenly teaching online, you're just another voice calling out from the void for your students' attention. And that can be exhausting because this is what you're up against suddenly when you're on the internet. So it, the decision for me to make goofy videos was, for one, it was a way for me to let off some of my own steam and quell my own anxiety. But I also wanted to make something that they would want to watch. Uh, it came at the risk of ending up like this, which is like, you know, mid thirties and trying to relate too hard to my students that are in their late teens and early twenties. But I really don't care because at the end of the day, I want my students to engage with kind of discomfort and uncomfortable processes. And for them to feel like they can do that, sometimes that means I have to make an ass out of myself and I just kind of come to terms with that. Uh, so I looked at my favorite entertainers who were also educationally bent like Bill, si Bill Nye the Science Guy and Mr. Rogers. The last uh, facet of my top secret plan, um, Plausible deniability. 
I've already mentioned that people in print are really technically savvy. So if you're familiar with the idea of plausible deniability from a financial standpoint or through politics, we have to think about three shades dumber. Um, think about when you are teaching a class and a student makes something that's not great and you call them out on it and they say, well, it's what I wanted it to look like. Okay, cool. So you made something that doesn't look good, but it's not that it doesn't look good. You wanted it to not look good as like a conceptual thing, right? Great, because that's what I did. Um, I am not a professional film person. So by thematically basing my videos in camp, theatrics, and just comedy, uh, I was able to get away with having blurry shots uh, filmed on my crappy DSLR because the point isn't to be Fellini. It's more along the lines of Ed Wood. Uh, so here are some very out of focus stills. It also kind of doesn't matter and it really adds to the funniness of it that my cat is like yelling at me in the background and my wife's leaving for errands so you hear the door slam. It also gave me an opportunity to use all of these like transitional wipes that there's no other really good tasteful use for, uh, but they're perfect in this uh, in this kind of uh, educational conceit. Anywho, thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Please keep in touch with me at one of these outlets. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. That was great. Uh, you had me laughing most of the time. <laughs> uh, really enjoyed that. Matthew Letzelter is an associate, um, is in a Portland, Oregon artist who explores his practice through works on paper, print, paintings, and photography, focusing on abstract landscapes. Matthew received his MFA in 2003 from Pratt Institute, Brooklyn, New York, and his BFA in 1998 from the University of Florida, I have to say Go Gators, in Gainesville, Florida. He is a, currently an associate professor at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. He is chair of the MFA in print media program director of Watershed Center for Fine Art Publishing and Research, and director of the post-baccalaureate residency at PNCA. Before moving to Portland, Let Zelter was the master printer at Singer Editions and visiting professor at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, while also fo focusing research on digital print mediums. Before moving to Canada, Let Zelter worked from Thierry Le Ontiel studio in New York City, as a professional fine art printer, he also worked for Petersburg Press and Suitcase Press in New York City. So this is Matthew Letzelter. Hello, this is Matthew Letzelter. I'm coming from the Pacific Northwest College of Art uh, in Portland, Oregon, and I'm the chair of the print media program here. Uh, I'm gonna focus my segment of this panel on how we returned to campus this year and have been very fortunate to have the ability to do that in the state, uh, which I know a lot of schools didn't have a chance to go back and just kind of talk about some of the things we put in place and what worked. As you can see from this slide, a lot of signage went into place on campus and uh, just a lot of new protocols of how to navigate the space and making sure that we're keeping social distancing and safety uh, as a priority. We were a very kind of fluid, open school, um, and we've really locked down to just allowing our community members to be able to come in, students, staff, faculty, uh, and then specific appointments for our outside community. So it's been really kind of constrained about who can come on site, uh, and we now are implementing to scan our ID cards just to make, be able to track and trace who's on and what time uh, in case notifications have to go out. And as you can see, signage is up everywhere, everything from how to enter an elevator to how many people can be in a room. This is an image of our orientation in the fall with some of our students. Um, they sent me this image just kind of uh, to show that they were following the, the protocols that we put in place. Uh, and this has one of, been one of my favorite images this year. Uh, I'm just happy that we were able to return to campus and have that kind of community uh, which has really kind of impacted us in a, a positive way. Um, with everything being put in place, we added applications such as Booked uh, to be able to reserve equipment and spaces to kind of keep numbers uh, in a way that keeps everyone distanced and safe in each lab. Um, luckily, our studios have amazing ventilation and we don't recycle air, so we've been very lucky to be able to kind of enter our larger 
lab spaces and be in a kind of safe environment under the circumstances. A lot of our classes have been um, split to allow for in-person in instruction uh, and keep distancing with, within the rooms. Uh, some of the classes have multiple sessions or we've found ways to do group meetings through Zoom and then students enter the space keeping, keeping distance and making sure that each space doesn't get overcrowded within our kind of protocols that we set up between the school and the state. This is one of our first year students doing an install for the first year review show. Um, we've also kind of had to come up with timing and spacing around how they enter the galleries and uh, interact within those spaces. This is an image of a project that I was working on with the artist Modu Diang. Um, we started this just before the pandemic hit and uh, really had to shift to doing a lot of our meetings and conversation over Zoom, which uh, is a new way of uh, collaborating for me at least um, a lot of our work has always been in person or you know at least some visits put in place but uh, this project really kind of shifted the way we thought about collaborating on site here's a just quick image of uh, the stack of the addition being done uh, and one of our second year students Edson packing things up uh, initially this was going to go to the Biennale in Africa in Dakar and uh, a lot of things kind of shifted but at least we got it done in the fall to be able to kind of hand off to the artist. You know we took other approaches such as like provisional press which was exciting to have uh, access to the plans to, to build these out for our students this year uh, along with kind of making kits uh, for students that felt uncomfortable to come on campus or maybe had a quarantine because of a possible exposure. So we've really looked at ways to support students, whether they're on-site or off-site. Um, we've been able to continue with some of our community projects uh, with everything going on in the United States, everything from uh, protests to political events to uh, we've had fires out here, we've had ice storms. Um, it's definitely been a challenging year, but we've really kind of taken the reins and have been able to support our community and uh, support our colleagues and students in ways uh, to keep them activated and uh, aware of everything going on during the pandemic. Another image of some of the films and prints that we've been making for our local uh, Don't Shoot PDX, which is an offshoot of Black Lives Matter. And uh, we've been working with them for the uh, past eight years. Um, just been doing some really fun uh, projects that have really mattered to our community. Here's a zine that we produced uh, uh, connected with our symposium that we put on in the fall, but uh, also really kind of focused on supporting our Don't Shoot PDX group. Um, they brought in an artist and we had our students kind of communicating with them uh, through Zoom about how to do this. And then I'll end with an image uh, from uh, an SGCI event a few years back that we hosted uh, back in 2016 and just kind of uh, looking back at when we could kind of get together as a group and hoping that uh, at some point we can move forward with this. Um, so please reach out uh, if you have any questions. I'm happy to kind of talk about what we did and what worked. Thank you. I'd like to present our next panelist. This is Asusena Trejo Williams, who is an interdisciplinary artist working in installation, photography, video, and sound. Graduating from the University of North Texas with a BA in photo photojournalism, post back work coursework in art and art education from Campbellsville University, and an MFA in studio art at Maryland Institute College of Art. Trejo Williams' experience in photography spanned over 20 years, including a career as a photojournalist and a photo editor in various national newspapers. Trejo Williams taught at the Dallas Museum of Art and Beijing University of Agriculture and is currently an assistant professor in art and design at Campbellsville University. She has presented in the Arts in Society Ninth International Conference on a collaborative project called Sound of Music, based on a system to de derive sound from a photograph. William Peace University Interdisciplinary Conference on the Evolution of Postmortem pho Photography from Victorian to the Contemporary, and at CCAC on Collaborative Problem Solving in the Contemporary Classroom for the Next 10 Years, Preparing Students for the Students of 2030 panel. She co-authored Peg. Pegasi and Beethoven, Sights and Sounds in Disney's Fantasia, and Mythological Equines in Film through Vernon Publication in 2022. Trejo Williams continues to exhibit her artwork nationally in both solo, in both solo and group at exhibitions. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for having me here. 
Um, I just want to, um, uh, as you can see, talk about um, teaching printmaking uh, at the Liberal Arts College. Um, I'm going to move forward to my first slide. As you can uh, hear from the from my bio, uh, I have a little bit of everything under my belt, um, and that's um, something that I um, think very highly of because I'm teaching Liberal Arts College. It's a small institution. Um, and so having a little bit of everything uh, experiencing in, in the making um, really suits me to be at this location. So having printmaking uh, as some of my background, I've shown in that as well and had such an array. I, I put all of those art makings into uh, calling it part of my toolbox. Um, so with being at a small institution, um, we are centrally located in Kentucky, geographically centered. Um, it's a small university, it's private, it's Christian, Baptist um, mostly uh, with, with ties to the Baptist um, uh, denomination. Uh, we have, this is our a shot of our main campus. Uh, we have several satellite campus in other rural um, communities, as well as sites in California, Canada and classes in, Indi in India. Um, we also have an, a huge online presence. So on main campus, we have about 1,200 students, but our enrollment's over 12,000, actually. So um, we, we have such an array of, of students um, throughout Campbellsville University as a whole, but on main campus, it's rather small. And we're also part of the Appalachian College Association. And all this is going to tie into some of the things that I... Um, was looking at as I was transitioning to be the faculty for the printmaking studio. Um, costs are a big, a big deal for our students who are low socioeconomic materials uh, and accumulating the tools that are needed. Um, and again, being part of the college, Appalachian College Association, although we're uh, remote from Appalachia, um, we still get students um, from that region. So those were the things that I was uh, having on my front um, and looking at uh, teaching. And I knew about one semester ahead of the fall 2020 that I was going to be teaching this. Um, and of course, COVID came into play. And uh, I, I've been thinking about printmaking uh, and how to move this class forward since uh, April of 2020. Um, and fortunately, uh, and here's a shot of our, uh, of our campus. Uh, this is the section where our art classes are. You saw earlier um, part of our, our buildings and the back side of this building and it has beautiful windows is where we're going to be at. So we're in a small location uh, and I was going to end up having five students in the printmaking studio. Um, and because of our restrictions and parameters, I was actually able to fit all of them in one classroom. Um, so I didn't have any issues with space um, as some other institutions would have had. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be uh, included in Chautauqua's artist in residency. And I noticed that there were uh, courses that were going to be offered along with it. And you can see our class meeting there on the right hand side. Um, it was all going to be online. Um, and so right off the bat, uh, first meeting with Sam and Brett was, I am going to do some of the assignments, but what I'm really after is partnering and having discussions of pedagogy. Uh, because at that point, we didn't know who would be in seat or if we were going to be going home at any moment. Um, our classes actually, you know, as we move forward, uh, they let us know that we would start off in seat and it would, we were just go and figure it out as we went along. Um, so I wanted to be prepared in any facet. Um, and so right off the bat, um, letting them know that I needed um, to have a different aspect, a different type of learning experience. I'd done the majority of the art making types. So part of it was deviating and how do I do it on the low cost end when I have to send students, what materials do I need to be able to send them with, um, uh, to their homes um, and um, how can we make it affordable and um, uh, plausible. So these are some examples of a variety of things that we did um, during the Chautauqua Institute um, and 
So we did, um, uh, I used collaging in this sense, but we also um, did uh, color graph. Um, we were going to do screen printing, but I had this kit at home that I'd never tried. So I told Sam and Brett, I deviated and tried um, using this photo emulsion on the screen printing process, um, which came into play later on. So I'll talk about that. Um, one of the things was, do, we, do I pull away lithography from the students or not let them be able to experience it? Um, I learned how to do kitchen lithography um, and it was a challenge. There was a lot of failures involved in collaborating and, and, and corresponding post uh, building this community. Uh, with Sam and Brett um, and having conversations uh, uh, with them post uh, artist in residency. Failures, I don't know how many times I tried it uh, in trying to figure out the materials as well. You know, it ended up being paper towels. Uh, that was a major issue, but also needing to think about how my students were going to get those supplies. Um, this was towards the end of our residency um, program. Um, so I started off the students with very, very simple process, getting them to learn relief um, and crossing my fingers the whole time um, that we would stay in seat. Um, always letting them know if we have 24 hours or 10 hours notice, these are the supplies you have to pick up and move. Um, so the lithography was one that I was really, really pushing for. And I tried <laughs> several times over and over. So that way, if they had to leave, how could I make them have the experience? Um, and uh, we ended up staying in, in the um, studio. We didn't have to leave at that point. Um, but this is an example of one of our students working on the kitchen lithography, use uh, Reynolds Wrap, Coca-Cola, uh, lith lithography um, uh, crayon and uh, lithography ink um, and during this process figured out that it's not available anywhere in my state so I had to be prepared with that and let the students know um, actually got a shipment in from Sam to help me out and worked with the students on um, preparing for those materials as well. Um, yeah I was very pleased um, they resulted first time uh, out the gate, they all were very successful and were able to make lots of prints. Um, and actually this one ended up being one of uh, their favorites. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it goes to show that even uh, discussing and learning um, and having this experience with the artist in residency was able to push me to feel comfortable enough to be able to get the students accustomed <laughs> in any variety of way and really feeling um, uh, secure that I could get them to uh, handle and, and have the experience of any of the materials. Um, as I move forward, you know, teaching the students about community, we're in rural Kentucky, and so it was, it's always a challenge for us. We're geographically centered, Louisville, Lexington, Bowling Green are all an hour and a half to two hours away, Cincinnati three hours, and so the notion of, of community is such a big deal. Um, and so I normally take students on trips for each of the classes at least one time. And this was such a challenge to try to wrap my mind around in the COVID time, what would I do, right? And also building community uh, with Sam and Brett, bringing them on, letting the students um, hear from them. Um, and then I came across, you know, teaching them social media and other ways to, um, to network and get to know other artists and see work uh, came across uh, this relief conspiracy exchange and utilizing the, the postal service um, as an exchange. So each student uh, participated as their final and they um, uh, sent out 20 postcards out nationally and internationally and in return received 20. So then they also started to become collectors themselves, but building that uh, reciprocity and then also community building. Uh, and that was a huge part um, that I wanted to make sure that they knew, but then the challenge was how do we keep going and making sure that that happens whenever we're uh, quarantined or um, during COVID. Uh, here's some of the examples that the students made at this point. They did have to go home in uh, middle of November. So this is from their studios at home. 
um, and they were ready to go. They knew the format, they knew what they had, uh, and, and they had all the materials that they needed to be successful to um, be part of a, a larger community. I think there was over 380 participants in that exchange program. Um, post uh, fall semester, I actually have a student um, who has uh, pushed forward and uh, in this one course that we have studio problems, the students get to select um, what their course focus is. And so on the left hand side um, is one of my students, um, Jermaine, who decided to push through and he's really gravitated to printmaking and he's at home, he's single dad um, and he's a non-traditional student. So he's able now to transition at home and be able to do um, some of the printmakings when he has to be home um, for his son. And so he's pushed forward. This is from this past week and now he's at five color reduction. Uh, so, you know, mama bear proud uh, that he's pushed forward and he was able to do this out of his living room. Um, and then on the right hand side, um, pushing my practice, but then also students in other ways to use printmaking. And so this is a photo um, litho that I was able to use. And because of my experiences from using the screen printing and the photo emulsion, um, I was able to do a um, uh, alternative photo processes and, and bring some of those other printmaking elements into it as well. Thank you so much, Susie. Appreciate all your input. Our next panelist is Christopher Thomas. He is an artist who makes paintings, drawings, and artist books. His work has been exhibited nationally at the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Yokes de Monde Gallery in Charlottesville, Virginia, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and Chicago ARC Gallery. Thomas has also exhibited his work internationally at the Foundry, a gallery based in London, England, and as part of the artist collective, The Printmakers Left, A Graphica Creativa, the 12th International Print Triennial in Finland. Thomas received his MA and MFA from the University of Iowa and his BFA from Arcadia University. Additionally, he studied at the Glasgow School of Art in Glasgow, Scotland. Christopher is a fellow at Hambridge Center for Creative Arts in Rabun Gap, Georgia. Um, has been an artist in residence there three times. He also attended the Atlantic Center for Arts in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. So here is Chris. Hi everyone, this is Christopher Thomas reporting to you from North Carolina, at UNC Greensboro to talk about uh, this past year in teaching printmaking. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I approach printmaking as a painter um, and a painter who is very interested in the idea of image dissection and translation across media. So this is something that we've really resorted to, you know, talking about a mixed media approach, utilizing printmaking as one method among many to investigate the concepts of seriality. Um, we have certainly taken advantage of rudimentary techniques, but try our best to push those farther. So even basic techniques like stencils will migrate into drawing and painting approaches in the studio. Um, the goal being that broadening the approach to media and the applied visual or stylistic language means that students were able to, I think, really focus on subject matter more, you know, really think about personal narrative across a series rather than um, isolating their focus on a single work at a time. Um, in the past, you know, in typical fashion, you know, a print studio is a fantastic energetic place, you know, students seeing what everyone else is doing and, and it's a catalyst for self-improvement. Um, printmaking is also traditionally a kind of collaborative community oriented um, endeavor. And of course, all of that was put by the wayside in terms, uh, instead of um, that, you know, we're, fo we're focused on um, a kind of personal studio practice. And that's been very positive. I think a lot of um, students have really been able to, in a professional and serious way, really look at the ways that their dedicated workspaces um, matter, that they can really take that seriously and engage in their work as a professional artist might. Um, you know, I saw students, um, you know, take advantage of the skills that they had employed um, and broaden them, you know, not being able to work in the studio meant that this artist 
focus their attention on learning how to bind a simple book so that they can continue working on compositional ideas for future screen prints. So that pivot um, is one aspect of this. And I think also the extension of looking at you know, basic techniques, but pushing it farther. These are first semester printers who are taking relief prints and like merging collage and hand drawing and taking the idea of seriality and really pushing it to explore a subject um, in a way that wouldn't have happened as fully um, in, in the time frame of a regular classroom project. Um, so this idea of resourcefulness and evolution uh, is something that is, you know, really important. You know, we've been put in this position where we're remote and we're talking by video. Um, teachers are becoming videographers. Um, and all of this way of looking at how technology and the space in which we inhabit now can promote new work um, is a subject that we've been focusing on. So students who are using um, older work to revisit um, old matrices and, and, and revisiting them with other mixed media approaches, collage becoming more ambitiously scaled painting work, for example, <clears throat> looking at this documentation um, as an objective formal investigation, looking at the works that we have around us um, more clinically, um, I think for a lot of students have allowed um, some access into ideas that um, were sort of percolating, but maybe didn't come out. So lots of scanning work, you know, trying to keep the ambition level up um, and also really trying to make work that is focused on um, scale and personal direction. Um, and also through series, letting students really dwell on personal narratives. That's been something that's been very important for many students throughout this semester. One last thing, you know, having sort of opportunities with video to see the ways that prints can be looked at um, in different ways, not just static, but by incorporating video into um, you know, sort of documentation means that motion and other ways of conceiving of images um, have occurred. Um, and last but not least, online critiques have been fantastic because of the way that students have been able to prepare themselves to um, prepare the work that they want to share and for reviewers to really have the time to reflect and write and offer comments and feedback in video form through writing through video and, and sound and so on. Um, it's been very fruitful in that regard. And it's also allowed us to look at new ways of generating um, imagery for projects, namely uh, zoom screenshots becoming our next uh, basis for project ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Uh, next up is Tatiana Potts, who is a native of Slovakia. She received her MFA degree in printmaking from the University of Tennessee and her BFA degree in printmaking from UNC in Asheville, North Carolina. She currently teaches at Hartford University as a visiting assistant professor in printmaking and bookmaking. Her work is in several galleries, publications, and collections. She most recently presented her work at a virtual session at the Occidental College, Los Angeles. Also, she showed her work at the exhibition at Alpaca Gallery in Albany, New York, and at Southern Printmaking Biennial at the University of North Georgia in DeLonga, Georgia. Tatiana, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to share my experience with the COVID or post-COVID teaching. So here I quickly wanted to show you a few slides what my work typically looks like. So here's a little. And here's the um, paper installations that I presented in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts. And then I skipped to book because it has kind of different sense of something is large or something is smaller. Um, this book's resulted right away as my first product after being stuck at home. I went to visit my daughter in Tennessee. I currently live in Connecticut. And um, it was supposed to be a weekend. It turned out to be six months. So I brought enough supplies for two weeks. That's how spring break was supposed to last, but um, lasted only for these 13 books that I created, uh, ranging from one inch to 13 inches. Not only that, that I had to kind of compensate how I'm gonna work in my studio or how I'm gonna make my work, but also I was teaching bookmaking class and relief class. So what I decided to do, show students and use miniatures to figure it out the structures first, 
and strongly encourage them to look for different resources for their material. Because what I found was most of the time, we did not have um, material. We did not have, everything was sold out like ink or paper. They went home with very little supplies. So I started to play with the idea of how I can encourage, inspire and motivate my students. So here is my very first tiny little mini book that I created with uh, leftover scraps from those 13 books that literally what little scraps I had made this book and actually drew in it because I couldn't print anymore. Um, the houses that I actually saw on my daily walks and kind of keep myself sane, right? Like everybody was working, uh, walking at that time. Um, and let's see how I, sorry, how I can advance this. Um, then I started to really intensively um, think about what kind of material we're going to use for these books because I constantly heard from my students, I don't have paper, I don't have that, I don't have that, what can we use? So I actively started to look what I use every day, what kind of packaging we use, what kind of paper we can use. I played with marbling, created these books. The prints are actually basically done in scraps of balsa wood and I used nails to push into it, not even uh, carved and hand print the, the pages for the book. And quickly, I'm gonna flip through different kind of examples that you see how I use the package and what I literally use. Strongly encouraged to cut their own work if it's prints or paintings and package them in different kind of um, structures along with this to help them to actually know how to create the book. I did create the de uh, demo videos uh, where I show the structure how to approach this. You can see in this example, I was itching to do something with the little egg carton and created 12 mini books. They are completely done with the recycled materials. There is nothing new. I cut up my prints and made monotypes. I cut the old used books or a box or packaging that the bag books are created from. Um, at that point of time, if you everybody remembers, it seems like everybody seems to be baking. So I started to also save the packaging from the flowers that we were using for baking bread and printed these chairs on the images, which I felt really represented as a metaphor for absent of my friends and family that we couldn't hang out and we were just stuck in one place and we were not allowed to interact. Um, and I need to go through this slide again, I'm sorry. So here is another slide uh, similar. I really stared at this box for a while. Being a printmaker, I just admired that engraving um, logo and around the box and I just couldn't get rid of it or throw it away and wanted to see what I can do with it. So I reinforced it with the book board and create this uh, four sets of the book with different binding. They were combined again with the prints that I cut up and created additionally pop-ups or printed as you can see on top of the monotype that I tried, um, additional um, dyeing of the paper with the natural ingredients um, or sources or pigments to actually create additional prints. So here's the example of wood block and also um, uh, the fabric, the fabric fa uh, substitution. Uh, not everybody could get a book board or book cloth. So I encourage to explore what do you have at home, old t-shirt, old shirt, or whatever kind of fabric they could actually do. Whatever I suggested in the material, I always tried, made a video so students can be inspired and don't come back telling me they cannot do it. Here's an example how I treated the paper. So the paper is not always only white. I literally used only sketchbook paper. Um, I dyed it with the uh, rose petals or even the avocado skins in the uh, pit. There were paper turn up pink. That was pretty exciting to find out. And also we created monotypes, which actually I didn't end up using regular ink, but open acrylics because ink was out completely and I couldn't even mm -hmm. order anything anymore. So I set up the um, um, plastic from the old frame. When I roll up the open acrylic, they sat on the table for about two, three prints um, before they started to dry up. And as you see also on these images that I printed it on sketchbook paper and also dye paper that I dipped before in that avocado mix or also um, tea bag staining. Um, another form of printing, I actually also tried the pressure printing where students were encouraged to cut their um, stencils from a cardstock 
and then I rolled in different ways. So when I printed it, I either pressed with my palm or used the spoon or used different methods to see what kind of different um, aesthetics we can get from printing. Um, and then again, continuously exploring what kind of paper we can use it. I'm, um, I love tea and I love my tea and I drink it a lot. So you can see I started to collect the tea, opening it up and saving the paper and printing my chairs that I previously carved and then sewing with the string that was actually attached with the label and created a new idea of how I can utilize it. Here are some few results that my students came up with. So Spencer created his book out of this can, Japanese the binding structure. And this one was very exciting by Hannah that she used literally food and tried various kinds of ways of how to combine it and make actually functional book. In addition to that, we quickly also created exchange portfolio where I wanted them to print small prints with handmade stamps with whatever material around the house they had. Um, so you can see that this student on the left created the thicker stamps and on the right they were combination with different ones. They can actually color register and here are the prints. So they printed enough for each student. We, uh, they shipped it to me. I uh, collated it and then shipped that bit and they created their own books and that's how they had exchange portfolio. So that was my take of how to inspire them for bookmaking and their release. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tatiana. That was amazing. Thank you, Tatiana. All right, thank you. Space to all of you and my fellow co-chair Brett to uh, ask questions of each other. Please unmute yourselves. Uh, and uh, kind of jump in. Uh, I think there's going to be a little bit of uh, interruption that happens as we, we speak and kind of talk about each other's work. I am very excited about uh, everyone's work. And if I can begin, I just wanted to ask Henry uh, to briefly talk about how you um, think about and use humor in your practice. Uh, because it seems like it's almost like a, a medium that you're kind of like interspersing and playing with. Um, and you're kind of like not doing exactly comedy, but you're thinking about um, how much humor to lay in, um, like how absurd can I go in my own performance to allow for my students to get access as I perform and work through ideas and, and trying to bring them into the space of uh, to garner their attention uh, and to want to participate in some of these projects. Um, so just curious how you think about moving in and out of that space. Um, yeah, in my, in my own personal practice, humor figures in, uh, quite a bit. And I, I mean, in, I can, I can go as absurd as I want to there, but it has to be dialed back for students to want to get into it because you're not, you know, I, I can't expect them to learn too much if I go too far with it. Um, but Humor is an easy way for me to identify with people. Um, it, it's just become a coping mechanism through my life. So rather than uh, try to annex it out of my teaching practice, I just lean into it. Um, sorry, I'm not very right. articulate with this. Henry, right Henry, do you, Henry I mean, did, is that is that set up with your kitchen and that whole model of like a public access thing? I mean, is that for you like a way to just simply get sort of, I don't know, for lack of a term, like kind of motivated to kind of like think about how to present this material? I mean, I just feel like, you know, my big concern, and I think we're all educators here. I mean, the big concern was how do you get across what you need to get across? And like, you know, we're learning all of these different platforms and we're redesigning classes on the spot, you know, doing all of this stuff where, you know, that, that, that pre-production, the production, and then the post-production, I mean, I've never seen anybody like Sam and Brett do post-production planning. You know, this idea of like all of these stages of like all of this work that has to be done it can be really daunting. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by like the way you found a model to you know, make it, you know, make it alive and make it kind of present tense. I mean, that for me, I think has been like the kind of online issue. Yeah, so it, on one hand, it was a way to get my mind off of the daunting anxiety of daily life. I mean, before the shutdown happened, my life was driving 
I was teaching and working for a research studio and on the weekends doing curatorial work in Philadelphia. And suddenly I had nothing but time on my hands and terrible news everywhere. So this became something that I could make something for my students that might help take their mind off of everything that was terrible. But for me, it gave me a way to you know, keep my hands busy, so to speak. Um, and it, it, it was a lighthearted gesture that I hope worked for them and it definitely worked for me. Um, it also kept my hands busy in uh, making my own work. Making these videos ended up being a really great exercise in getting re-familiarized with video making and it affected my personal practice greatly from there. So um, I, I did think about this from a strategic standpoint also in that I could help revitalize my life instead of just sitting still and you know, being depressed and unable to move. Uh, this gave me a reason to get out of bed every day. I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot from here and and shift our focus to a different um, a different panelist. But I I think this is a beautiful place to start out with what I uh, what I wanted to um, what I, I really love where you're going with this because it, it it talks more to like I think what all of us kind of went through and kind of what this post studio printmaking shift is all about. Um, and I, I kind of want to jump over to Tatiana and talk a little bit about your practice because you, in your presentation, talk about, you know, you move through various materials and, you know, you're like trying all these things out, but also you're running out of stuff. And then you're literally making dyes in your home space and whatever is on hand, it looked like you found wood and were carving that you know, with your, your wood carving tools in order to make prints. Uh, and I just wanted to give you a little time and I, I'm sure the other panelists wanna ask you questions as well, but could you talk more about what that experience was like? And, and Chris, I'm sure you have some experience here as a, as a paper maker about like, what's that like making your own dyes? Uh, you know, seeing those rose petals soak in water. I don't know if that was water, but that just like, that got me so excited about thinking about, you know, I've, I've dyed with tea and coffee before, but thinking about growing my own dyes and making my, has any of this changed your own practice for the future and what you're look forward to making Tatiana. And then it looks like your teaching practice has just kind of expanded because of this with everything that you kind of played with in your students. And I, I wanted to see if you could both talk to the ways that you were practicing and talking about your practice as a way or a model to move forward, which seems a, very akin to what Henry was doing. And then um, how, how did you use that as a, as a place to work from for your own teaching? What was interesting with these things is like, um, honestly, I do lithography. I love detail and monotype seems to me usually you know, one time thing, you can get a ghost and you don't get out of it a lot. So I never was really deeply interesting in making it. But because pandemic happened and there were limited resources, what students can have or how we can ship them anything, then you always felt, what can I do? What can I do? And I emphasize the fact that, you know, one day you're going to graduate. One day you have no access to print shops. So this is a fantastic opportunity to sit down and find a way how you can actually make this happen. What are you going to do afterwards? Like, how are you going to inspire yourself? So that's why I started to just stare. I mean, I always like nice packaging. Sometimes I find myself buying something just because I like the, you know, graphing on top of it. Um, so that was one thing, kind of inspiration. Like, I just want to try it, what happens, because they don't have a book board. So I told them, use the cereal box. And then having them just kind of coming up with ideas, how else you can utilize it. Um, and then, then monotype, I was a little more patient because as Henry said, I had suddenly a lot of time on my hands. I didn't have another supplies that I wanted to use. So what am I gonna do? Um, so I was trying various things to see what students can afford, what they possibly might have, what are the alternatives and how it's gonna work without too much frustration. Mm -hmm. um, and then adding that, you know, simple things like, well, you eat every day, you have cereal box, you, you have the flour, you have, you know, I drink tea. I mean, there was just many things that I was like, I'm just not going to throw this away. Maybe, you know, I even use like security envelope because they have nice pattern on inside. So 
things that just keep your eyes open and look what you can use and don't come back and tell me you have nothing. You get a junk mail in your box. Like you have something that you look around and you're gonna find. Um, but so with that kind of resources, I was really amazed what they actually came up with and what they wanted to try. Um, but also my practice itself, I do like when I might make my books, I typically want to invent the new shape. So that was also beneficial for me because then I push myself to invent, like what happens if I do this? Like, oh, look, like I can do book in shape of a bottle, you know? It was a little frustrating because there was a lot of hand cutting and hand matching. But then, you know, the sketchbook paper was running out. It was not interesting to keep it white. I didn't have color inks. So I was like, what happened if I died? Like, let's just dip it in the tea. Done it before. But then there was a pretty rose bush that we had in front of the yard. And my boyfriend goes like, well, go and use that. Why not? Like, let's just try. So we started to test the different kind of colors what we had. I even used cauliflower um, or um, let's say cabbage, not cauliflower, cabbage. That was really pinky nice color. Then I even like dropped the one time I dropped the lemon in it. It turned beautiful magenta color. It was amazing, but the paper didn't like maintain it. It just kind of faded away. So that was also learning what what it happens. And then I had funny responses through you know of course I posted everything on Instagram or Facebook through this I mentioned groups for you know distance learning and kind of sharing. Um, so many bookmaker approached me, you know, how do you make that non-acid, you know? And I was like, that was not the point. <laughs> like, I know I added acid to it, but I mean, the discovery of how you can change the color or work. So not necessarily looking at everything, like it has to be archival. It has to be gallery piece. Why don't we invent something that you already have and just look at it from different point of view? So that's how I was approaching it. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I think this question applies to Chris as well. Um, and just kind of piggyback off that. We talk about all these kind of communities that we had for teachers, right? And like printmakers and artists. Um, but I want to kind of talk about since your presentations were so diverse in their presentation and the ways they were made and the way you connected with students is like you mentioned in your presentation that students were more attuned in critiques and things like that and more engaged. So what were methods or ways or things you realize um, in establishing a print community that was virtual and that we couldn't be in the same space with one another. Well, I think, you know, it is, it is true. I mean, it's fascinating as artists, I think how everyone is in their own space. And I really feel like the point of this panel and like that as on a personal level for me, like the idea of a studio is like very like linked to, you know, all that I do, you know, that there's this kind of, you know, logic there that develops through time. And I think that we know that as artists who've been doing it for a while, but I think, you know, students get this flavor of it in a class, which is, you know, important. But, you know, I think we've been like pushed into this or students have, you know, in this way that like the studio, like the personal private studio is like front and center and like, you know, like, like all of us, like, I mean, you know, Susie, for example, like students who like, who knows where they are and like what they've got, like, it, it's a kitchen table, it's like a garage, it's like, maybe you're lucky, you know what I mean? It's like, and not only is that realistic, it's also kind of inspiring. And like, I think, you know, what people are talking about, Tatiana, this idea of resourcefulness. And I think that, you know, and, and even, and Henry too, like talking about like the way that we operate, you know, I've not seen a kind of evolution in my notion of my own studio in the past years I've ever seen, like this kind of thing where it's just like, I do all kinds of stuff in my studio now that I would have not done a year ago. I mean, I've got drums and guitars. I've got like a video hookup now. I've got like my paintings going. It's like, it's just become this very different place. And, you know, because we're sharing online and like the, the classroom community is kind of all hands on deck, you know, partly we're talking about that very like huge part of being an artist, you know, which is like being in your, creating a space to do your work. Um, yeah, I feel just like that aspect of being an artist is often kind of bypassed. And so, 
we should talk about that. Someone very early on in this conversation mentioned like professional practices as being rolled into everything. And that makes a lot of sense, you know? And I feel like this is one of those instances where that's very logical to talk about how do you do what you do? To be very transparent, to be very open and sharing like these kinds of resources that we're doing right now. I mean, this kind of attitude of, you know, we're working together and kind of like creating that artistic space it just seems that's become very much more open in the classroom conversation. Yeah, I, I love that about this conversation about what is uh, what is the shift that happens in the pandemic uh, or because of it is that, you know, there's this, let me rethink the ways that I make and let's really talk about how to help you make stuff wherever you are. Um, and however you can do it. I think that's really beautiful. Um, and, and really questioning what is best practices. Do you need the, uh, as Henry so beautifully put in your video, um, do you need that amazing press? I, I forget the exact name that you mentioned, Henry, you know, with the beautiful felts and it's brand new and it's like shining and glistening and you can almost see it in your mind. Or um, do you make do with what you've got? And can that still produce the same quality of work that you would want to come through the other end of that press, you know, every time you, you crank it through? Um, with I worry about that. I worry about that, that students don't know that distinction, though. Like that there's a, there's a level of like quality control. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that things can yeah. be like when you see something very high end, beautifully made, you know, and if you've never seen that and like not known that, I don't know, it opens up those kinds of conversations. But at the same time, I think what happens on the ground is like so rich. Yeah. So I think it's just like this kind of balancing that will happen. I think in all of your presentations, I saw that theme kind of run through, right? Like there's a call and response now between students and professors or teachers in that we have to meet our students where they're at, at but they also have to meet us where we're at. Like we had to adapt our teaching um, kind of strategies to meet the time um, and adapt to their making strategies or their limitation of supplies or their location so on and so forth, the room that they had to work in, the size and scale. So that kind of call and response between, you know, faculty member or professor or printer and student um, as we're all going through the shared experience. Well, that's what I, I thought it was really beautiful in Susie's presentation showing the work that the student had made at home. That reduction print was just wild and beautiful. Have you had a lot of students getting back to you with works that they've made since? Yes, um, but he's the one that really has trajected um, pretty nicely. Um, he, like I said, he's non-traditional. He's had a really interesting background, um, but he um, is self-taught, um, you know, some of his work. And so I've had to really work with him on, you know, refining and pushing him. Uh, but now it's just like the flow is really nice. I've worked with him, like how to go through process and, you know, the assignment uh, when he, he put together his course focus for that class you know, it was like three color reduction and he came back and he's like, here's five. And, you know, the fact that he transitioned even within, you know, the academic year is not done yet. And he's like, this is what the artwork needed. The concept needed it to push further. And I was like, mama very proud, you know, in this sense, but what's really important for him is he's African-American. He's He's lived in rural, he's had a really um, challenging um, younger life. And so him and having his voice and pushing that forward and really crossing into our, our contemporary and our time this past year, especially with Black Lives Matter, it's really pushed him forward. Um, he was actually granted an artist in residency program. So it's been really exciting to watch him. But, you know, I think in some of the other students, they're really interested in also uh, mixed media. And so that's the next step that I want them to see is that it, that's not the end. And so the crossover to Tatiana's uh, presentation and showing that um, is really, um, has me really energized um, because also our students don't have money for resources. Um, that's one of our biggest pullbacks. Um, and sometimes they don't sign up for courses because of that limitation. So we try as much as we can to help support them, but how can you continue making when you don't have something? You shouldn't halt 
your art making. It should continue pushing you forward. So I appreciate your uh, all your efforts, Satiana, and your presentation and seeing that. I love the collective of, of, of some of those packaging and the Starbucks. I think that I was really amazing because that really crosses over um, into different disciplines of you know, environmental concerns as well. Oh, yeah, um, and so our university does a lot of things with cross discipline. So that would be a really great exercise um, as well. All right, thank you, Susie. Um, I hate to draw this short. I feel like we're just getting to the tip of the iceberg, but I, I wanna thank you all for being here with us. I'm really appreciative again. I know I've, I've said this all to all of you over and over again, but Brett and I are so grateful for your participation and your willingness to be a part of this panel. Um, and then we're very excited to post this in the near future. So thanks again. <laughs>